Good evening, everybody. Uh, Shilsbury Wallerstein and David. I see it's already past a lot of people's bedtime, so I'm going to try to be very brief. Um, the rabbi of our community where I grew up used to begin his sermon with, before I speak, I want to say something. So I also want to say something before I speak. A number of years ago, I was working with a <coughs> young girl who was school phobic. And those of you are familiar with classic school phobia, I'm not talking about today with the bullying issue, but in classic school phobia, the rule of thumb is you have to get her into the school. You have to get her back into school at all costs. And I was insisting that she go to school, just in the building, she doesn't have to go to the class, she has to go to school. This was a very entitled, wealthy family, young girl, and she was giving us a very hard time, so we had a meeting with the parents and the principals at the school. And she was trying every way to get out of coming to school, and I wouldn't let her get away with it. No, you have to go to school, you have to come to the building. And finally she had a total meltdown. And she started crying, and she started screaming at me, and she started telling me how much she hates me, and what a terrible psychologist I am. And then she decided she's going to come with a knockout punch. And she said, I'm going to tell all my friends what a terrible psychologist you are, and nobody's going to come see you. And I said, that's fine. Just remember, my name is David Palkovitz. <laughs> um, I, uh, a name and actuality is very important. And we even saw in this week's Parsha that the Benos Slavkot are associated with Yosef. Torah goes to great lengths. Because both showed their love for Israel. Um, I bear a very special name in the work I do for Ohel. Uh, my official title at Ohel is the Zachter Family Chair in Cro Trauma, Crisis, and Bereavement. And it really, as a, in, in acknowledging my benefactors, Mel and Phyllis Zachter. And I, and I just want to say it's both a privilege and something very scary. It's a privilege to bear the name of a family that does so much for the community. On the other hand, I do it with some trepidation because it really raises the bar and the expectation. Um, I'm going to talk tonight. I, I changed my focus. I actually have a prepared you know, two-hour speech here. No, I have a prepared speech, but I decided, based on the experiences and the exposure that I had this past weekend, and I too want to reiterate, echo what Dr. Perlman said, and gratitude to the community here, to the dedication, but a lot of the things that I heard over the community, uh, the weekend, from the community, and I want to sort of address this. And what I want to address is, what can the regular guy do about the problem of kids at risk and the problem of overdosing? I mean, let's face it. Most of us are not Mel Zachter, Jack Jaffe, Chesky um, uh, Stern. We're not, we're not the kind of people who can run out speak luck. We're not the kind of people who can undertake maybe a, a huge program. But what can the regular person do, like most of us, to get people who are working hard just to get by, regular people who, want, who see this problem, what are the small little things we can do? You know, the Muslims farm talk, they'll talk about Rabbi Akiva and how he saw the water dripping and went through the stone, and when it penetrated the stone, he realized that Torah can penetrate his heart. So they asked the question, which drop broke the stone? Which one was it? And the answer they often say is the first one. Because even if it took 2,386, if it hadn't been the first one, there wouldn't be 2,386 drops. So what drops, what little things can each of us do, us regular people, for this problem? So let me talk about a few things. First of all, again, I'm supposed to talk about risk factors. When we, the research on risk factors for uh, addiction are very complex. It can never be reduced to one thing. It's everything that causes problems that the Perlman mentioned, the, uh, the aversive childhood experiences. And the strange thing is with trauma or risk factors, if let's say we take 10 risk factors, and each one we give them a value of two. The math is different than regular math. Because if you have two of them, it's not two plus two equals four, it's two plus two equals six. But it's everything, it's mental illness, it's traumatic events, it's family stress, it's financial stress, uh, it's all the factors, and by the way, a significant portion is hereditary. You know, one of the problems we always have when we look in risk factors is if we identify a risk factor. Let's say we say that, um, I don't know, let's say that to have, have been exposed to abuse is a risk factor for, for addiction. But then we'll identify a whole cluster of uh, young people who are terribly abused and never abuse drugs. 
Why, why are some do, some don't? There's a significant hereditary factor. We're not clear what, but there is, we know the research shows about 40 to 60 percent, as it does in most psychiatric uh, ailments, is, is hereditary. But it is the host of issues and mental illness, etc. And this harks back to what we spoke about here in the community on Friday night. We have to stop being scared of our humanity. We are like everybody else. And just like the community, just like somewhere between 10 to 25 percent of the community does at varying points in their lives suffer from a mental illness, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether it's personality disorders, whether it's the more severe ones, it's bipolar. We are, we are afflicted by it as well, and we have to do everything that we can to destigmatize mental illness and to make it easier for people to seek out help. And that's something you can do. We spoke about this Friday night. You can do this by not making jokes about being crazy. We can do this by, by not being so terrified by Rebbe Shaduchim because somebody was once in therapy for something. We can eliminate, as a, as a community, we can treat those people who have psychiatric ailments as we would anyone else who has any other kind of sickness. And that way, make it more, make it more readily easily, easy for people to go for help and then prevent a later deterioration. Um, they talked about, Dr. Perlman talked about Rat Park and about embracing, the, embracing by the community. The research shows convincingly that people who have connections and relationships are less at risk for addiction. The classic research is the research on dinner, eating dinner together. I'm going to cite that research right now. It's a 2011 study, but there have been many. Compare teens who had frequent family dinners, five to seven times a week, to those who had infrequent family dinners, two or fewer, are almost four times more likely to have used tobacco, more than twice as likely to have used alcohol, and two and a half times more likely to have used marijuana, and almost four times likely to have said that they expected to try drugs in the future. Spend time with your family. Spend time with your children. Have dinner regularly. And by the way, I have to address something else that I'm seeing in the community that's terribly concerning to me. It has become almost an addiction that you have to have guests over every Shabbos. And it becomes almost like you're embarrassed if you're just going home with your family. And it's wonderful. And it's wonderful that we have this community. But from time to time, you should at least, well, maybe even most of the time, have a Shabbos meal just with your family. Because I don't have to tell you what happens when you invite people over. You know, you're having it, you, know, you, you send the kids to the kitchen, they eat some salami, they run out and play, and you talk to your friends. You're not spending time with your family, but try to come home for dinner, try to spend time. And I know it's very hard. We all have four jobs, and we're all trying to make ends meet. You know, I remember it's, it's, uh, people used to ask me, I have besides Ohel, I, I teach in YU, I, I, I supervise at, at uh, LIJ in Long Island Jewish, I have a practice. When I tell people that, I said, you have four jobs. I said, yeah, one for each tuition. But it, it's, it's, there's a lot, of, it's, it's a lot of pressure. But we have to go out of our way, even if it means coming home and spending time, make, a, make ourselves spend time. Walk, you're going shopping, you're going somewhere, tell your kid, come along. Have that connection. Those connections are significant types of prevention. There's another important type of prevention. Um, one of the things that came up over this weekend and I, I think we have to address this. And again, it's not the only reason, but it's that drop. Is the issue of kids getting into high school. We're having a significant crisis in our community. We're growing. We have this meteoritic growth, and our schools are not growing fast enough. And more and more kids today are not finding high schools to go to. I know that in my neighborhood, the local public high school now serves kosher food and has a minion in the morning. Now, some of the kids have to go to the, to the public high school because of certain needs. But many of them are just kids who just couldn't get into any school in, in, within our community. And our community is better than most. Now, I'm not talking about the kids who are, who are terribly at risk. I'm not talking about the kids who maybe could be, uh, you know, Mazik, could be Mahdi uh, Sarabim. I remember um, one of the principals when I worked in the school many years ago he used to say, I'm not going to sacrifice Am Yisrael for Rabbi Yisrael. But the increasing percentage of the kids who are not getting into our high schools are just kids who are not exceptional. They're just average. They're not the most brilliant children. They're not the top of the sheer. And more and more of our high schools are rejecting kids. More and more of our high schools are now saying, we're only for the top kids. We're only for the, for the Mitsuyanim. And more and more high schools I'm hearing about are canceling on their Bayes and Gimel classes. We only have Olive classes. 
and they're busy telling the, 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 the parents, take your kid to this school or to that school, busy doing admission for other schools. So what can we do? We're not going to build more schools. What can the average person do? So I have a suggestion. And this, this, as I said, this came up on the weekend. You are the parent of the Aleph child. You are the parent of that exceptional child that all the schools are drooling to have in their program. And you have a choice of what high school to go to. When you make pick, pick the school that has the Bayes and Gimel class, even though you're in the Aleph. Because when the parent of the potentially Bayes and Gimel class comes to the school, ah, oh, you're, you're, you're lobbying for your child. But when the parent of the Aleph kid says to the school, I want to go to this school that has the Bayes and Gimel class, because I want my child to know that even though he or she is exceptional, that's not the Jewish community. That the three million people who got the Torah at Har Sinai, not all of them had 150 IQ. And you're making a very important statement, and you're helping prevent kids at risk, and you're helping prevent addictions by doing that. And by the way, if you do serve on a board of a school, and they announce that they're can canceling the Bayes and Gimel class, express your preference. Because we're all better off, even the Aleph kids are better off, when school has more heterogeneity, and when school has more collected uh, group of children, even those who, are, again, we're a community for everybody, not just for the Mitsuyan. That's how you can that's a form of, pre of prevention. Let me mention something else that I think is an important part of prevention every single one of us can do. It's two weeks into the summer. I can't tell you how many phone calls I've already gotten from camps about issues and problems that are going on in camp. Now, most of the kids are having a fabulous time. Very few people call up the director of trauma and bereavement for OL to say that the kids are having a wonderful, wholesome time, learning beautifully and, uh, and playing sports, and what are you going to do about it? But the ones where their problems are, the camps or the parents, are the ones that are calling. Now, this may sound simple, but it's just something I think very important. Camps rely on us. We pay, we choose. And when the camp representative comes to your home to play or sends you the video or the interview with the camp director whether you're going to send your kid to this camp. I want you to ask him the following question. That witching hour, you know what the witching hour is in camp, between when lights out and the kids are supposed to go to sleep, when the counselor who spent his entire day with these bratty kids finally has a chance to have a little time for him or herself to go and play ball and to read and relax, hang out with their friends, and you have one OD supervising the entire campus? Is that what's happening? You have one person watching the whole campus? Or is there an adult, or is there some sort of counselor figure who is in the bunk? Because it's during those times that sometimes, sometimes some pretty awful things happen. And again, I'm not saying that the only reason for kids at risk, or the only reason why we've seen these kind of suicides is because of, of, uh, of uh, sexual abuse, though it's a significant one. But we are seeing, because of the way we're educating our children, we're seeing a decrease in adult to child abuse, but we're seeing a dramatic increase in peer-to-peer -peer abuse, and we're also seeing a dramatic increase, especially in our community, of sibling abuse. And if you can do something to reduce that, and we've done something, we've done something to reduce the adult to child. Children are much more empowered, children are much more educated. And so the credit of a lot of organizations, including those that are represented here, so that, is ha that has happened. But now we've got to focus our attention on the other type of abuse, because that's also a way to prevent addiction. And in camps, we have, to, we have to tell the camp directors, in today's world, we want more supervision. At, now, there should be an adult with the children, all that, well, what they call adults. I mean, those are children taking care of children, but hopefully there should be some sort of adult watching over them. We have to be more sensitive to people who are suffering. I want to share with you, I'm going to say it very obliquely because I want to divulge what it is, but I want to share with you a conversation I had that was traumatic for me. <coughs> it happened to be that I had to go to a school, as is often the case, following a crisis, I don't want to specify which, <coughs> in case someone narrows down what school it is. But there was a crisis in a school, one that was very derailing to the staff and to the kids, and that's what I and the whole team does. We go to the school, we meet with the kids, etc. And it happened to be the alma mater of a relative of mine. My, my relative of mine had gone to that school. So I had to see him, show the evidence, said, you know, I was in your old school. And I told him what had happened and why I didn't need my intervention. And he said to me, you know, when I was there in high school, there was a kid who, who took his life, who committed suicide. We don't use that term, commit suicide anymore, we, for reasons we're not going to go into. But 
Yeah, he took his life. He happened to even sit next to me and I was davening. And the next morning we schmoozed it out for two minutes and everything was fine. I said to him, Moshi, whatever his name is, if I was looking for a high school for my kid and I heard about a school that had a tragedy of that magnitude that schmoozed it away for one or two minutes, I wouldn't want my kid in that school. Do you have any idea? Has that mother slept one, one night since then? Where's our heart? Where's our feeling? And, we have to, and if we're connecting, if we're connecting to other people, we have to have more of the heart. We have, we have to take away this notion that strength is not being emotional. We have to look around our community and see what's going on and feel it. And then if we feel it, we extend ourselves. And that's also a way, another drop of water of what we can do, is that we can connect us so we can help all those people potentially at risk. If there's a recent divorcee in your community, invite them over for a meal. Divorce is not a communicable disease. Let them know you still respect them. You still think highly of them. If there's a family in your community where a parent has been incarcerated and the children are struggling with this, give them, invite them along when you go on Cholomoy to, to the park or to the amusement park. Those are the drops of water, and I'm telling you from personal experience, I know. That's that little bit that makes a difference that could really prevent an addiction. One or two more points, uh, and then I'll conclude. It's it, the way it works with addiction is to get somebody into treatment, sometimes to get somebody to, to achieve abstinence, as I'm sure Dr. Perlman and all those who are working in the field know, you gotta be really hard with them. You can't be, you know, you really have to overcome part and parcel of addiction is a denial. And you really have to sometimes hit them over the head and, 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 and twist their arms till it hurts for them to get the help that they need. But if they go for the help, and if they do it seriously, they deserve our respect, they deserve our commendation, they deserve our forgiveness, if you will, and we have to embrace them. You know, there was, uh, back in the Reagan era, Nancy Reagan was uh, one, of her, one of her themes, or one of her undertakings was substance abuse, and she had a theme which was, just say no. So many people in the substance abuse field said that Nancy Reagan now has a solution to the homeless problem. Just buy a house. You know, it's not that simple. And I have to tell you the work that I do, and I don't do direct intervention in, in, in addiction, but I certainly will work with recovered addicts. When they reach those anniversaries, I give them tremendous commendations. I say this is bigger than anything else. You've said this is huge, and it really is. And, for, and you have to understand that for those who have addicted, once they've tasted that, once they've been in that realm of pleasure, once they've had that endorphin rush in their brains, it's always there. I, uh, I had a cousin from, through marriage, and he, again, I'm saying you, you won't figure it out because my, most of my family are <laughs> dispersed throughout the globe, but he was one of these hippies who wandered around the world in bell bottoms and psychedelic shirts doing drugs like crazy, somehow found himself in Israel, wandered into the Kotel, somebody got their hands on him, and today he's a from guy and he's learning and, you know, a serious from guy. And he came originally from France. And I remember his telling me, after he was already 20 years from, my visitor, he'd say to me, I, his family in Paris has to visit him in Israel, he'll never go back to Paris. He says, I'll step off that plane and I'll go right back to drugs. After 30 years, his father became too old to travel to Israel, and he finally went to visit him in Paris. But it took 30 years. It's not easy. You know, if I can just reference the Pasha, the Shus of Rabbanim, you know, we Pinchas got the brisi, brisi Shalom, he got the bris of peace. So Hamik Dovah says something very beautiful about it. He says, why does he have to get this, uh, this gift of peace? Because he committed murder. He got a taste. I have never murdered anyone, so I don't know, but He's got that taste of that omnipotence of what it was like to take a life. And it could become part of him. So Hashem rewarded him by giving him shalom, by making him peaceful, so he won't become addicted to it. But that's, that's the nature of addiction, and we, we do need God's help that the recovered addicts have that help from God so they overcome that addiction. But we have to embrace them. And in fact, it's very interesting. I want to cite one quickly, one study. It's a study that's very interesting, not even about addiction. But it really, it also co uh, connects with us as Jews. This was a study done in 2006 by Dr. Kaur, who was an anthropologist. And he studied Nepalese children between the ages of 5 and 14 who were kidnapped from their homes and forced into the army 
and experienced the terrible atrocities and violence. Part of our history. It replaced Nepal with the Tsar. This is part of what, what we went through in the, in not so long ago ourselves. But he found something very interesting. Those who came back after 20 years, 30 years in these kind of situations, came back to the villages. Those who were just ignored, nobody referenced, nobody talked to them, nobody did anything special for them, had very high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. Those for whom the community embraced them, those who the community had, had celebrations, welcomed them back, helped them reintegrate them into the village, had very low rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. That's what we have to do for the recovered addicts. Let me just conclude with one other important consideration, which I think is, again, the drops that we can do. You know, the research in the general community is, we talk, you know, the hot topic in addiction is opiate addictions. And the, again, it was referenced earlier. And the highest rates of overdose of opiates in the general community, but I'm not sure if it's clear, if it's true in our community, is in actuality in the uh, baby boomers, among the 50 and 60 year olds. And one of the theories is, the reason they do, is that they lived at a time when we had painkillers, when we had life was relatively easy. They never experienced terrible, terrible hardship. So as they get older and they experience pain and infirmity, they don't have the wherewithal to, to cope with it. Now, we do live in very wonderful times, <clears throat> very easy times. One of the things I often think about is what it was like for me to go to school and what it was like for my kids to go to school. I went to MTA, uh, up at YU, I, the, uh, the YU campus. I took a subway. We had to take that treacherous walk from the subway station to school, and the neighborhood was a very bad neighborhood at that time. And I had to learn how to be alert and, uh, and, uh, and how to circumvent potential trouble. And many of my, uh, my friends did get mugged and did get hurt. In fact, I often uh, like to tell them when I first started working in the field, one of my first jobs was to work with court-mandated teens who were violent teens who went to court and were trying to see through therapy we could help them. I had a group of some of these very rough kids. And I used to say that when I'd meet their parents, they looked vaguely familiar. Said, Did, didn't we meet once on Audubon Avenue and 184th Street? You know, you were there with four of your cousins with bats and chains, and I was alone with the barely used Bubba Kama. Don't you remember? I remember it like yesterday. You know, it was a hard, you know, Baruch Hashem, my kids went to school right in their neighborhood within a mile of our house. They could walk there, they could bicycle there in a safe, secure neighborhood. We have, our lives are much easier. But you know what? And we have to live in our times. And I'm not suggesting that we purposely send our children to the ghetto to school so they, they somehow grow and benefit from it. But sometimes we're a little too careful to protect our children from difficulties. We want to insulate them so much and we have so much of the wherewithal. I can't tell you how many kids I hear from kids I work with who talk about classmates who don't pay attention in class, never do their homework or anything, and we ask, how are you going to pay us? It's okay, the tutor will do, teach me. They're going to school knowing they're going to be tutored and they don't feel any effort. I mean, I remember even with my kids, I had a rule of thumb. My kid came home with 10 math problems and they had, could do eight. And they were struggling with two, I would help them. If they came home and they knew two of them and they, they couldn't do eight, I wouldn't help them. Because it means one of two things. If the teacher didn't teach it right, you're not paying attention. Either way, you, they have to know that. I'm not going to teach you math. And we have to think in terms of our children that we don't overindulge and we don't make life too simple because a big chunk of addiction is removing pain, as was mentioned, is to, is to sort of anesthetize ourselves. And sometimes children have to struggle. And sometimes children have to learn a little bit from the school of hard knocks. We don't have, one of the things I also can never understand is this thing with play dates. I was told by a school, and I won't say which, but by a school that parents are calling the school and asking the school to please make sure their kids have play dates this Shabbos. And the principal said, well, that's my job now? I used to tell my kids, you know what was a play date when I was a kid? You went to the playground, and you played until the Italian kids beat you up. And then you went home, you know? That was, you know, you limped home, and that was the end of your play date. You didn't need a watch, you didn't need a dime. That was, that was it. And with today we have to even control how our children play and their social interactions. We need to sometimes let them learn how to struggle themselves, let them to learn to tolerate, appropriate for our times, a certain amount of difficulties and hardship. I'll conclude with just a thought that I had. You know, when we, we read the Parsha of, of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, and before the Kriyas Yamsev, it says, 
Ki Amar Elohim, that the God didn't take us the direct way because God said, I don't want the nation going back. So there's two keys, two becauses. But there's a mahlokus between the Rambam and the Ibn Ezra, what this means. Because we know ki is a word that has many meanings. So the Rambam says, ki, the first key means afal pi, even though. God didn't send us the direct way, even though it's closer, because he didn't want us going back. But Ibn Ezra disagrees with him, and it says both of them mean because. Because it was close, and because we didn't want going back. And I think there's a very profound lesson there, because I think Ibn Ezra is telling us, sometimes just the fact that it's difficult, sometimes just the fact that it's challenging, is enough of a reason, that there are two reasons. That sometimes we have to let our kids have something more challenging, so they can face adversity. Um, it, as, or as the Kotzka Rebbe said, there's nothing more straight than a crooked ladder. And those are, again, some of those drops, and I, I'm sure there are many more, and we can hopefully talk and discuss some more, but those are little drops in which we can make a difference with addiction. Thank you.